Welcome to Reading the Bible Together and to Genesis chapter 50, part two. There's so much to look at in this chapter. And where we ended at the end of part one, everything seemed to be coming to a close. And you might think it's time for, and they all lived happily ever after. But the wounds and breaches in the family mean that there's still a significant lack of trust. Even after the reconciliation of chapter 45, where everybody eats together and, and the invitation to live together in the land of Goshen, the brothers do not believe at all that Joseph has truly forgiven him, rather that he's just waiting for Jacob to die and then he's going to take his revenge. And who can blame them? All of those carefully planned tricks and plots and schemes of Joseph, that the money in the bags, the cup hidden in Benjamin's sack, the favoritism given to, to Joseph's children and so on. These have all left deep scars that are not easily wiped away. You know, that old dad always loved you best, mom always loved you best thing that plagues families even into our day. Well, now that Jacob is dead, will Joseph turn on his brothers? Following family tradition, the brothers come up with a cunning plan based on deception. Surprise, surprise. They send Joseph this message. And notice that they send the message rather than delivering it themselves. They're going to stay a bit clear of Joseph till they know that the coast is clear. The message that they send is, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you're to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now, please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. And they admit, the text points out that this is something that they made up. So it, it, it's a barefaced lie. What is interesting here is the reaction of the ancient rabbis and commentators. You might expect them to say, shame on these brothers and their deceptions, putting words into their mouths of their dead father. How dare they? But no, the ancient Talmudic commentaries tell us it is permissible for a person to modify a statement in the pursuit of peace. You read that again. It is permissible for a person to modify a statement in the pursuit of peace. Another ancient source tells us it's not only permissible, it's required if that's the only way that peace could be attained. Now, you might rationalize their message by saying to yourself, well, you know, it's true that Jacob never did say that, but it's doubtless what he would have said given the chance. Well, this is very interesting. Sometimes in our own family situations, sometimes Complete and brutal honesty will cause strife and discord. Where at other times, well, we find ourselves in the position of modifying a statement in the pursuit of peace. Something that the ancients have thought about a lot and this story brings right before us, something for us to think about today. Well, why didn't Jacob actually say something like the brothers claimed that he said? Well, he assumed that the reconciliation was complete. Jacob thought everything was fine, everybody's fine, but the brothers doubted. Well, what was Joseph's reaction to this deception? When their message came to him, Joseph wept. Why did he weep? Because the message is proof that the brothers don't trust him and that reconciliation is indeed incomplete. So he weeps, but he doesn't send them a response. And so having received no response, the brothers now have to work up their courage and appear before Joseph themselves. His brothers, we read, his brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. There was that dream coming to life again. Nothing's been accomplished, it seems, in all the time since the brothers first came to Egypt, bartering for food and bowing before this high-powered Egyptian official, which happened to be Joseph. But, but all of this is working together to bring us to the climax of the whole story. Listen, listen. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. 
So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Wow. Now, there's a lot in this response. First of all, he says, am I in the place of God? This brings us right back to Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden and the temptation of the serpent. Eat the fruit and you will be like God. That's where all the trouble began. And now that's the beginning of the book. And now Joseph, with godlike power, has the authority to condemn his brothers. But unlike Adam and Eve, he rejects the temptation to be like God, to put himself in the place of God. Am I in the place of God, he says? Something important has been learned here. Secondly, you might have thought that Joseph would have been fully justified in enslaving his brothers, even as they had caused his enslavement. After all, J Joseph's no stranger to slavery. His economic policies effectively placed the entire Egyptian population in bondage to Pharaoh. But instead, Joseph establishes what would become a central Israelite law. We read this in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. That's the principle that Joseph is establishing here. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. That's Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. But that's not the whole verse. Here's the whole verse. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You see this climactic verse in Genesis, am I in the place of God? No, God is the Lord. And as a result, I will not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone, but I will love my neighbor as myself. This climactic verse in Genesis, the verse that the whole book was building up to, would become the central pillar of the teaching of no less than the Lord Jesus himself. In Joseph's words, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives is not only a wonderful summary of the whole Joseph saga, God was behind the whole thing, but is nothing less than a summary of the arrest and torture and crucifixion of Jesus itself. Joseph's words could be Jesus's words post-resurrection. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. In fact, the work of Jesus was the saving of us all. So Genesis chapter 50 not only brings us all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, not only brings us forward to the exodus and the deliverance of the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt, but it brings us all the way to the death and the resurrection of Jesus himself. It's all tied together. And so, as much as it could be, the family is reconciled. Joseph lives to 110. Not coincidentally, what is regarded in ancient Egyptian literature as the ideal lifespan. He lives long enough to see not only his children, but his great-grandchildren by Ephraim. We're also told that the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were born upon Joseph's knees. That's an unusual phrase. The NIV translates it as, we're placed at birth on Joseph's knees. And that means more than old granddad dandled the nippers on his knee. The exact phrasing in Hebrew means that Joseph adopted these grandchildren as his sons, granting them equal status with his own sons. And this is reflected much later in the book of Judges, chapter 5, when Joseph's grandson, Mahir, is in fact listed as a tribe. So, 110, full of years, Joseph breathes his last, and he too is mummified, according to Egyptian custom. But not before he promises his brothers that God will surely take notice of you. Pekod Yifkod in Hebrew and he will bring you to the promised land. In Exodus 3, centuries later, God tells Moses that he has indeed taken notice of his people using these same words. And as a result, God will undertake their deliverance. That 
promise of Joseph is coming true in the story of Moses in front of God at the burning bush. Joseph has the brothers promise to take his bones with them when they leave. It'll be Moses who will fulfill this promise of, of bringing the bones of Joseph from Egypt into the promised land. But interestingly, rather than being buried in Hebron with his ancestors in the cave with Abraham and Isaac and the rest, we read in Joshua 24 that Joseph is buried in Shechem, the very place to which Jacob had sent Joseph, then a brash teenager, to check on his brothers who decided to throw him into a well at the very beginning of this astonishing story of Joseph and his brothers and the beginning of the Israelite nation. It comes full circle. Wow, that's a lot. And we're going to have a summary next time on the entire book of Genesis. Well, we'll wrap it all up. And we'll see you then.